This morning I want to uh, share with you from Psalm chapter 33. And we want to look at the very fact that God and God alone is worthy of all praise. And not just in a cliche way or something that we sing in the songs that we sing, but truly that we recognize that God is indeed worthy of all praise. And so we want to look at Psalm 33 this morning. Let us read it and then we'll read it again in a little bit here. Psalm 33. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. I love Psalm 33. And there's a uniqueness about Psalm 33. There's a few others that are unique in this way, but Psalm 33 is without authorship, at least known authorship to us. Now, there's been many that would speculate and would press that quite possibly, and maybe they are right, but quite possibly that it is David that pens this psalm, but I like to think the unknown nature of this psalm is a blessing to us because this is a psalm that every believer should sing in his heart. A psalm that should resound from the innermost being of every child of God. A recognition of the magnificent God that we serve. And psalms are wonderful to read, and I think we don't give them the acknowledgement as often as we should. And maybe we find ourselves feeling that the psalms are somewhat repetitious, but I would think if we look back at our own lives, we would see our lives are repetitious. We have moments of joy built on moments of joy, and we have moments of despair built on moments of despair. We have wandering and wandering and burden and exclamation again and again all the days of our life, and this is what the Psalms express. The Psalms reveal the heart of worship. In fact, the Psalms teach us to worship. The Hebrew word for worship, the most common Hebrew word for worship, means quite literally to bow down or to fall down. This is what we see in the Psalms, the heart of worship. The Psalms present to us a dependency, 
They present to us exaltation. They present to us exuberant joy. They call us to thanksgiving. They remind us of God's judgment. And they comfort us with God's deliverance. They present in the Psalms the attributes of God, His great might. They present the concern of God with His creation and for His creation. The Psalms embody a very emphatic nature. They are illustrative, expressive, helping us put words to the feelings and the emotions and the places that we have been. And yet, there is a humbleness, a moldability, and a theologically centered resolve to God in all circumstances throughout the Psalms. And this is what sets the Psalms apart from much of what we see today in worship or the redefinition of worship within the church or the joy that the world seeks for the joy that the world seeks is that which is circumstantial or that which is sensational. And sensationalism is not worship. It often portrays itself as worship, but sensationalism is not worship at all, for it comes out of a very pride-centered, me-centered, what I can get and then overflow from sense of response to God, but it's backwards. True worship comes from a God-given understanding of who we are apart from God and who we are in Christ. And when our heart realizes, it, realizes that, by the awakening of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it exudes joy. It overflows with worship from our heart. That is worship. That is worship. Consider the Psalms. Consider the life behind the Psalms. David, Moses, the others, as they write these psalms out of knowing God and knowing the trials of this world, pray the psalms. May they lead you in prayer and in worship and in a closer relationship to God. They are more than the expression of man. They are the words of the Holy Spirit moving through men. The psalms are the very word of God. This morning we want to look at Psalm 33 specifically and we want to break it up as it systematically moves through the praise that is due to God. In fact, the praise that God requires. Our response to that. We'll do this by looking at it in four parts here this morning and may we be encouraged by Psalm 33. Let us read it one more time. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to Him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is upright. And all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. And the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps and storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen for His own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by 
great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart rejoices in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the incredible nature of your word that we can open up our Bibles and we can read from this life-giving word that is afresh, that is new to us every morning. It is great. It is life-changing. It is inerrant, infallible. It is sufficient. Lord, I thank you for that. May we desire to plumb the depths of your word, to spend the days and the breaths that you give us getting to know you deeper, that we may glorify your name greater. Be with us here this morning. May our hearts be soft to your word. May our ears be attentive. And may our hearts desire to change. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we want to break this up, as I said, in four parts. And the first part, if you're taking notes, is this. Worship deserved. Worship deserved. And the psalmist presents this to us in the first five verses of Psalm 33, and we don't need to read them all again, but within these first five verses, there is a very clear command that is given. In fact, the command is given in the first three verses, and it's given not once, twice, three times, four times, but five times. In the first three verses, we find the imperative used, the command that is to worship. It says, sing for joy. Not just if you have a good voice. Sing for joy. That is a command to the believer, for it follows it up by, oh, you righteous ones. It says in verse 2, give thanks. That is the imperative. Give thanks to the Lord with the instrument. It says, sing praise to him, which again is the imperative. Verse 3, sing to him the imperative. And then play skillfully the imperative. Command, 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 command. Worship God is what the psalmist is saying. There is no out. There is not, well, that's not my gift. That's more so their gift. The overarching command here is that we indeed worship God congregationally, individually. We present the glory that is due Him to His name. We honor Him. We lift Him up. And look at verse 1 once again. This worship that is deserved to God, it says, Sing for joy in the Lord. Very specific. Very specific. We can give thanksgiving to God for the things we have, but our relationship with God should not be about the things we have. You hear me? We can be thankful for the things we have, but the reason we worship God isn't just because we have things. That's prosperity theology. That's selfishness. That's human pride. That's, if I don't get a cookie, I won't be happy. Sing for joy in the Lord, for the Lord is the source of all joy. Anything outside of the Lord, as good as it may seem, for as long as it may seem, always falls flat, always falls short, is never enough. Find your joy in the Lord. O oh, you righteous ones, it says. Speaking specifically to those who are regenerated in Christ. 
Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Those who know the joy of the Lord. Those who God has revealed himself to. Those who have experienced God in their lives. And if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have experienced God in your life. The Holy Spirit has done a work in you. You are His. You are made new. You are seen as righteous because the blood of Christ covers you. You are the righteous ones. You might not feel like it every day, but in Christ you are made righteous. And if you are in Christ, you have a duty, and that duty is to sing for joy in the Lord. Why? Why? Because it says praise is becoming or fitting or lovely, is what this word means, to the upright. It's what you should be doing. It's your job description. You know, we have all sorts of different jobs, different things we do in life. And one of the most important things to understand when you do something or whatever it is you're doing or whoever you're working for is what is the expectation? What do you want from me? What, what should I be doing that I will be pleasing or lovely before your eyes as my employer or my boss? Because, you, you know, you can work in a certain factory and you can do many different things, but if you're not doing the things that you need to be doing to keep production going, you're not making anybody happy. Maybe you're happy, but you're not making anybody else happy. And it says praise is becoming to the upright because praise is fitting for the righteous, for the upright one. Praise is lovely before God from his children from his children. And in fact, this goes both ways a little bit. Because of the work that God has done in our lives, we automatically, it's one of the fruits that we produce as believers, praise. Praise is fitting to the righteous ones. Therefore, it's fair enough to say, if you are not praising God or worshiping God, if you struggle with that, if you have a hard time with that, if it never is happening in your life, you need to question your view of God. You need to question your relationship with God. Do you know Jesus Christ? How can you not know him and scream out, holy is the Lord, worthy of all glory, honor, and praise is my King. Worship deserved. Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Look what it says in verse 2. Tells us a couple things now. It says, give thanks to the Lord and sing praise to the Lord. And this giving thanks and this singing praise, as I've said or shared already, is a product of the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and just for notation on this, look at what Ephesians chapter 5 says. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for this is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And what is this? Being filled with the Spirit look like or produce, it says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. This giving thanks and this singing praise, as verse 2 in Psalm 33 says, is a product of the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives, but it's even more than that, folks. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This command to find our joy in the Lord, to sing for joy in the Lord, and then to give thanks and sing praise is a result of submission to the Holy Spirit in our life and being filled not only by, with the Holy Spirit in our life, and that filling is not that we somehow have to grab more of the Holy Spirit as if we didn't get enough at regeneration, 
but rather it's the Holy Spirit getting a hold of us, not being confrontational, standoffish, but allowing ourselves to be used and submitting to the leading, yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But it's also purposefully determining in your hearts to study the Word of God, that you may know the Word of God, that the Word of God may come out from you and be used by the Spirit to praise God. Because the things of God are revealed in the Word of God. The things of God are revealed in the Word of God. Give thanks, sing praise, and verse 3 gives us three directives to doing this or what this maybe looks like. It says, sing to him a new song. It says, play skillfully with a shout of joy. A new song, skillful playing, a shout of joy unto the Lord. When I think of these three aspects to this praise and to this command, a new song. And I think it's fair enough to say this new song is maybe a reminder of the new song that we will sing when we are with our Redeemer in eternity. When we think throughout the Old Testament of the children of Israel being given the song of Moses, a new song after being freed, after the Exodus, freed from the Egyptians and singing this new song of their redemption. And one day we will have this new song, but I think, I think it's even more than that. I think it's for the here and now. Because verse 1 speaks about those who are righteous. And no one is born righteous. No one is born righteous. We need the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. We need to be transformed. We need to be, in fact, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, a new creation. And when we are a new creation, that new creation also has a new song. We sing the joy that is in the Lord. Not the songs of this world. Not the songs of our old selves. But the songs of our Redeemer. The songs of our God. And I think it's worth taking note of play skillfully here. And this isn't specific to the fact that unless you can play an instrument or have a voice that turns heads in the right way. There's many voices that turn heads in the wrong way. Isn't that funny, eh? You hear that certain voice and you're like, oh, who is that? Is that me? Trying to hear yourself? <laughs> I don't think it's speaking specifically to that, but rather to the order in our worship. Play skillfully. Worship isn't chaos. Worship is a gift from God that needs to be handled correctly and rightly. Play skillfully. Do it rightly before God. And I love this last statement here in verse 3. A shout of joy. I don't know if at the Grunthal EMB we're really good at shouting for joy. In fact, it might be more of a whisper for joy in our singing. But shout for joy is not spoken in some, you know, different form of, of, of language or grammatical feature here. Shout for joy is exactly what it means. In fact, this Hebrew word means a blast of war. A declaration, the trumpets resounding off as we have victory or as we move in. In fact, if you think about this command, shout for joy, look at 1 Samuel chapter 4 where the same word is used. Verse 5 it says, As the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth resounded. Does Grunthal resound? When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp and the Philistines were afraid. Psalm 47, you can just write it down, we won't turn there. 
Psalm 47 speaks of this shout of worship to our God. You know, our worship for God should be the shout of joy that those around us know there is a God in heaven and those who do not know that God in heaven are shaken by our shout for joy. Because they know that that Grunthalian B loves the Lord, their God, and that Lord, their God, has changed them. Shout of joy is that running over of worship. That which is not hidden under a bushel, no. But it is that light in the world. A declaration of what God has done in our hearts. When I think of this new song and playing skillfully in the shout of joy, I think of man's chief purpose. And think about this for a second. If you've ever uh, uh, looked at those confessions of faith and the first one is, what is man's chief purpose? And I know some of you know the answer already, but the Bible tells us very clearly that man's chief purpose is to bring glory to God. Not glory to yourselves. It's the world's chief purpose. But man's chief purpose as being created by God is to bring glory to God. God is an eternal being. The attributes of God are unfathomable. Yes, he's, he's revealed them to us in his word, but we can't think that we could possibly grasp the, the, the totality of who God is. And so I think this idea, in fact, I'm quite sure that this idea of bringing glory to God is the reason for eternity. Because you know what? It's going to take all eternity for the glory of God to be given to, the, to God. That which he deserves. We need to be shouting with joy and with praise to our wonderful God. Verse 4 to 5 here in this opening five verses. When we think about worship deserved presents five areas. Five areas or five reasons that should compel worship within us. The psalmist records this for us and he does it linking them together and leaving the last one kind of as a result of the first four. In fact, he presents them to us in couplets and they're linked together for a very apparent reason that I will share with you here right away. Let's look at it here quickly. It says in verse 4, for the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. The word of God and faithfulness go hand in hand. The word of God is upright, meaning straight or level. It's perfect. It's balanced. It's not crooked. Isaiah 26 verse 7. If you turn there with me. says, the way of the righteous is smooth, O upright one. Make the path of the righteous level. And the word of God directs us to that level path. That it brings us into a right standing with God and into righteousness. Proverbs 8 verse 1 to 11 speaks of this further. It says, does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? On top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Besides the gates at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the son of men. O naive ones, understand prudence, and O fools, understand wisdom. Listen, for I will speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will reveal right things, for my mouth will utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choicest gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all desirable things cannot compare with her. The word of God is exactly that. It is better than the riches of this world. It is wiser than the wisest individual, the greatest teacher on this earth. 
The word of God is upright. But the word of God is paired with the faithfulness of God. For what is the word of God without the faithfulness of God but mere sayings or ideologies or things that some may attach themselves hoping, hoping that they will actually happen. The psalmist pairs the word of God with the faithfulness of God reminding us of God's great faithfulness that he hasn't forgotten us that he, his word will stand and will come to pass. 1 Corinthians 1.9 reminds us of this. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 reminds us of this. Turn with me to Hebrews. We'll look at that. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. So five areas of reasons that should compel worship is the word of God itself and the faithfulness of God throughout his word, that which we know in our lives and is known to us as a church. But look as it goes on here in Psalm 33. Verse 5 it says, He loves righteousness and justice. And it's very popular in the church to speak of righteousness, isn't it? The love of God, the goodness of God, the righteousness of God, the call of God. But what about the justice of God? Righteousness is what is right. Another way to look at righteousness is the mark that is defined by God that we must attain to. The target. The principled point. This is righteousness. The Bible speaks much of righteousness. Psalm 11 verse 7 tells us of the righteousness of God. It says, For the Lord is righteous... He loves righteousness, and the upright will behold his face. Matthew 6.33 tells us, in fact, commands us to seek first his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto us. Philippians 3.9, Paul is saying that all else in the world is counted as loss, but the righteousness of God. But if righteousness is what is right, then justice is what is due or what is owed in regards to that which is right. So if righteousness is the mark that is defined by God, then justice, I think, is easily explained as the defense of the mark defined by God or the guardian of of that mark defined by God. This is the justice of God, and without the justice of God, folks, you can't have the righteousness of God. What kind of a righteous God would be okay with sin? What kind of a righteous God would make commandments and declarations and never uphold any of them? What kind of a heaven would we have without a hell? We don't like to think about these things. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verse 21 it says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified or declared righteous as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And how did Christ Jesus do this? Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, the appeasing sacrifice for the wrath of God in his blood 
through faith, his death on the cross. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at that present time so that he would be just, he would be right, and he would be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justice, the justice of God, necessitates the atonement of Christ. Because God is righteous and God is just, for us to have any hope, there must be an atonement. And we see that through the Son on the cross for our sins. This presents to us a choice. As John 3.36 tells us that if we reject the light, if we reject that which Christ has done on the cross, there is an eternal wrath for us. But if we accept the life, if we accept Jesus Christ and the work that he has done, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. His righteousness. Righteousness and justice are an inseparable absolute. They cannot be apart from themselves. And these four areas or reasons that should compel worship lead us to the fifth one here, the end of verse 5. The earth is full of the loving kindness or the mercy of the Lord. The mercy of God is evidenced everywhere we look every single day that we have. The mercy of God is extended in the general grace of God to all humanity as the sun comes up and the sun sets and the crops grow and the rain falls and God gives opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to wicked man. And it's realized in the special grace of God, the saving grace of God, the knowledge that comes from a relationship with God. And again, take note as it says here that this mercy of the Lord, the earth is full full of the mercy of God. Worship deserved, and this leads us to the second aspect here this morning in Psalm 33, and that is this. The first is worship deserved. The second is sovereignty displayed. Sovereignty displayed from verse 6 down to verse 17. We see the sovereignty of God declared again emphatically declared again and again and again. It says things like, by the word of the Lord, not by a big boom. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. It talks about him gathering up the waters together, by laying up the deeps and storehouses. It says, he commanded and it, was, and it stood fast. He spoke and it was done. It says the counsel of the Lord stands forever. It says the Lord sees all the sons of men. He fashions the hearts of them all. It goes on and on and on declaring the attributes and the magnificence of our God. And worship, when we think about worshiping God, worship should always, not sometimes, worship should always lead us to the fact of God's sovereignty. To deny the sovereignty of God is to fail in worship. The worship of God should always lead us to the sovereignty of God. Recognition of His power. And not just that He is powerful, but that He is all-powerful. That he is omniscient, that he is all-knowing, he is the all-wise one. And of his presence. That he will never leave us nor forsake us. That he is aware of all that is going on in this world. And all that goes on in this world is due to the providential care of our God. 
And there should be a degree of awe. In fact, an overwhelming sense of awe as we reflect upon the greatness of our God. Verse 8 speaks of the magnificence of these perfections. It says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the earth be overtaken by the awe of the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And that word awe in Hebrew means to turn aside from or to leave the path, to shrink away, to fear. To have a fear as if we are in now a strange place, unknown to us. It's not to veer off on like a crooked path into some other direction. But because God is so awe-inspiring, we must hide ourselves. The wonderful nature of His holiness. Of His holiness. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. And when we think of the holiness of God, we can think of Moses before the burning bush. Take off your feet. This is holy ground. We can think of Isaiah in the vision. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Think of Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Elijah in the cleft. The transfiguration of Christ. The glory of God revealed just in a part. Look at verse 10. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. Proverbs 16 Verse 9 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And the psalmist is alluding to this fact. And for us, as we worship God, there is comfort in this. You know, there's comfort in this in the midst of COVID, when all the things are going awry in the world and all the different rules, all the different directions, when we're wondering who's in control, who's steering the ship, we can rest assured that our God is in control. And no matter what man says in his heart, God is in control. Amen. Amen. And there's great comfort in that. Great comfort in that. Verse 11 and 12 speak to the supremacy of God. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. He doesn't just speak and it not happen or have effect. And it isn't just for a time period. It isn't just for the nation of Israel as God worked with them. But it's from generation to generation. Or, in other words, what the psalmist is saying, always. Always. Verse 11 speaks specifically to the eternality of God. The counsel of, his Lord, of the Lord stands forever. Psalm 119.81 speaks of the word of God lasting forever. 160 says the same thing. Isaiah 55, 8-11 tells us that all these things in the field are going to fade away, but the word of our God stands forever. And it will accomplish that which it is set out for. Verse 12. I better take some water here. I'm getting too hyper. Verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I think we should think about that for a second. Blessed is the nation. Blessed is Canada if God was their Lord. You should consider this, wonder about it, agree with it. 
I mean, throughout the Old Testament, we have the wonderful example of Israel. And when Israel was obedient, they were blessed beyond. They experienced peace and joy and prosperity. And when they were apart, ruin, famine, destruction, captivity, plagues, struggles. And I think it should pose a question in the midst of our worship, why don't we pray for these things? How often do we pray for our nation, for our country, for the nations of this world? Do we think that the Lord's arm is so short that he can't save our prime minister? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 6 commands us for kings and for leaders to pray for them with petitions. And then it speaks of the dispositional state of God that he desires all to come to Christ. Verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven, he sees all the sons of men. There's nothing hidden from him. That includes our lives as well. Verse 15, he who fashions the heart of them all, he, uh, he who understands all their works, all are created by God. Acts 17, 24 to 28, in him we live and move and have our being. Romans 9, 14 to 23 is created instruments of wrath for destruction and instruments for his purpose and all to demonstrate his attributes, his patience, to bring glory to his name. And there's many questions that come with that. But he is sovereign. Verse 15, it uses the word, he who understands all their works. And this is twofold. This understanding speaks to a known state. As Psalm 139, 1 to 4 would speak of the omniscience of God who knows all things. He knows when I lie down. He knows when I get up as the psalm goes, goes on. But the other side of this understanding is that he considers all that we do and rightly discerns all that we do. In fact, look at, look at 1 Corinthians. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians here quickly. First Corinthians chapter four, verse five. Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, so he knows all things, and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. He discerns all things. He knows why we're doing them. Hosea chapter 7 verse 2. And they do not consider in their hearts. This could be spoken of me at times. And they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. Humanity has a thing for not considering the fact that God knows everything we've done and are going to do. Verse 16 to 17. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. Horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. These are not just aimless words spoken to try to encourage us. Look at what the Bible says. Exodus 14 to 26 to 27. The Lord caused the sides of the Red Sea to come crashing down and devour the entire army of the Egyptians. Not one Israelite had to cast a stone, swing a sword, nothing. 
Joshua 6.16, they blew the trumpets and what happened to Jericho? The walls came crumbling down. Second Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat, the mighty horde, the Moabites coming against them. What must we do? Our eyes are upon you and the Lord says, don't worry, the battle belongs to me. And the next morning when the nation of Israel went out, they went into the field and it says very graphically, all that was there was corpses. John 18, 3 to 6. In the garden, our Lord and Savior, the Roman cohort, the priests, Judas. Are you him? And Jesus says, I am and they all fall to the ground. In Revelations 20, verse 7 to 10, the battle of Armageddon, the nations in all their pomp and their force will gather and it'll be over. And immediately judgment. The king is not saved by a mighty army. The third point here, salvation determined, verse 18 to 21. And by determined, I mean committed, realized. There's five characteristics of faith that is presented in these verses. It speaks to those who fear God, those who have their hope in God, those who are patient towards God, those who rejoice in God, and those who trust God. God. And it reminds us that it's not just the justification that God determines, but God requires our sanctification. There's too many people in the church that believe they're declared righteous to go on living however they want to live. And they forget the whole doctrine of sanctification or being made holy. And the fact, the very clear fact in the scriptures that this is a key component to our salvation. But it says here, verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And Proverbs 9.10 tells us that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of God. Those who recognize the holiness of God. Those who by the grace of God have recognized their sinful state and have turned to God and have been redeemed by God. Those who tremble at the things we read in the scriptures are compelled by the things we read in the scriptures that we might live those things that we dare not step outside of those things. And when we do, we are so quick to come back in repentance because God is a holy God and we desire that holiness. It's that fear of God that drives this hope. This hope, and if you notice, these five things are like links in a chain as they build one to the next. It's this fear of who God is, the fear of the nature of God that drives us to place our hope in God. It says, on those who hope for his mercy or his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. We hope for his mercy and we desire that right satisfaction that is found in a right relationship with God. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, as he shares the Beatitudes with us, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Those who hope and desire. And again, consider the order here. Right fear produces right hope, leading to right satisfaction. Right fear produces right hope, leading to right satisfaction. And when we're satisfied in the mercies of Christ and the mercies of God, there's a patience. Verse 20, 
a patience that envelopes the believer. It says our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. We don't need to run off in other directions looking for other things. Our soul waits or is patient for the timing of God, for the ways of God, for his deliverance, recognizing that it's only he that can deliver. And we're patient in God because we find our heart rejoicing in God because God is enough. Verse 21, for our heart rejoices in him. There is a lasting gladness towards the believer. We again are satisfied. It's not a fickle satisfaction. It's not a fleeting satisfaction. But we truly are satisfied in our relationship with Christ because of who he is. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 4 to 7. And we rejoice in the Lord ultimately because we have the assurance of God that produces trust. We trust God. We trust in His holy name. We have committed conviction in our heart. We have a God given resolve. And we are producing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the characteristics of faith. That this worship exudes from. And as we close here this morning, the last verse, it's a benediction in fact. But it's our fourth point also here this morning. State of dependency. Living in a state of dependency. Verse 22. After all these wonderful things, the command to worship, the greatness and the sovereignty of God displayed through these verses, the call to the characteristics to have in the life of the believer, the heart of the faithful, the heart of the righteous. The psalmist says, let your loving kindness, O Lord, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us. At first, that's an odd statement at the end of this, after all of this worship has taken place and this recognition and the experiences that God has blessed the believer with already, and yet in the midst of that expression of God to his creation, there is this desperation, Lord, don't stop. Don't stop. Let your mercy be upon us. Let your loving kindness be ever be within us and before us. And he says something very key here. According as we have hoped in you. It's a recognition that God doesn't bless unfaithfulness. Be merciful to us as we commit ourselves to you. May your blessings rain down upon us as we submit to you. As we worship you, as we recognize your greatness. As we desire your fellowship. As we come to your word. As we yield to the spirit. As we live our lives for Christ. It's a call, it's a request, it's a response. And it's a humble awareness to our state and a known need for his hand above all else. It's ultimately in this last verse that it summarizes the whole message. That he alone is worthy. Let us pray.
Dear Lord, I thank you for your word once again. For this reminder, Lord, it's so easy to be busy, especially in the summer months. To get so busy with all the things around us, the things to do, the joys that are before us, the lake and to forget to praise you, to worship your holy name, to do the things that are pleasing in your sight, to study to show ourselves approved, to declare the gospel, to shout for joy of your greatness, your magnificence. Lord, may we exemplify the right characteristics of a believer. May we fear you. May our hope be in you. May we be patient before you. May we rejoice in the Lord and may we trust you with all our being. For you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.